We want to see God. How powerful he is. How easily he can heal our child. How easily he can deliver us from this debt. How easily, how powerfully, how lovingly he can take us to a greater glory in life. You want to see that, see? Unless you see that, faith will not come. Victory will not come. Be it unto me According to your word According to your promises I can stand secure You carve upon my heart The truth that sets me free According to your word, O oh Lord Be it unto me Be it unto me to me according to your word according to your promise I can stand secure God upon my heart to set me free according to your word oh I think the meditation would have gone for a long while. You know why? You read the words that follow. Verse 16. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. <laughs> Indeed, the deep trembled. What is he thinking of? He's thinking of the Red Sea incident. He's thinking, what must have happened? You see, these are words that came out of his meditation. He's saying, when you split open the Red Sea, the waters, they saw you. And they, when they saw you, they were afraid. The deep of the sea trembled at you. Verse 17, the clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. <laughs> He's thinking, for a sea to split open, what must have happened? <laughs> you think it would have just split open just very ordinarily without a great scene? No, no, no. There must have been a great scene. The clouds must have poured out. There must have been rain and a storm and the skies were thundering and arrows of lightning were flashing on every side. Verse 18, he's imagining the thing, you see. He's not just reading and going on. Verse 18, the crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. All that one incident, Red Sea incident, he's thinking how it would have happened. See? Verse 19, your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. He's saying your way was through the sea, your path through the waters, but no footprints are seen. What does he mean? Verse 20, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and what he means is it was not Moses and Aaron that led the people through the Red Sea. It was you by the, through Moses and Aaron who led the people like a flock, like a shepherd leading the flock. You walked them through the Red Sea. That is why in verse 19 he says, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were not seen. 
See, he's meditating. One incident that happened some point, God did it, great miracle. He's spending so much time thinking on it, dwelling on it, just opening his mouth, imagining and confessing and just spending a lot of time. What is he doing? He's praying or he's meditating. What is he doing? He's meditating and he's praying. It's all part of that, see? You can see the psalmist doing, all over, doing this all over the place. You may say, what is this, brother? You know, I thought you might tell me a simple method of how to pray. You're saying leave alone the problem. Rarely glance at it. Occasionally. Yeah, and just focus on God. See God. How do you see God? Word. Listen to preaching. Uh, read the word. Not just read the word. Spend time in meditating. Where is the time for all this? How can I do all this? My problem is there. What about my problem? You know, I realize sometimes we are in an emergency, right? It's like we need something to happen very quickly. We are in a very extreme situation. And at those times, there's nothing wrong to say, God, I need you. Right? I need your help right now. I need you. you know, sometimes you can't do anything. You just simply open your mouth and say, Jesus. Just say the name of Jesus. And God comes to your rescue. I understand all that, you see. In an emergency, you do that. But you, you know, that's like going to the emergency room. But you can't always be running to the emergency room. What about the regular checkup? You know what I mean? You can't always be praying like you're in an emergency. Every day, you know, God, I need you for this. God, I need you for that. Just five minutes to pray. God, I need you to do this. Finished, over, bye. Emergency prayer, that is. Running to the emergency room and saying, see me immediately. In my extreme situation. No, no, no. See, we pray like that sometimes. Sometimes we need God's help desperately. And we can seek it and God will help us. But that's not how to run a prayer life, my friend. That's not how to pray every day. That's not how you improve your prayer life. No, 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 no. To improve your prayer life, there needs to be an input of the word. There needs to be a meditation on the word. There needs to be time spent on that. The five-minute, ten-minute prayer, ten prayers will not do. And even when you have a problem, you see, I want to show you Psalm 119. We are saying, you know, oh, the problem is so big. That's in my mind I need something to happen about this. You're saying read and meditate and do all this. Where will all this happen, you know? How can this be done? This is very hard. Psalm 119, verse 23. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. He's saying princes are sitting and princess means very powerful people. <laughs> very powerful, very influential people are sitting, gathering together, and plotting my downfall. They're plotting against me. Now, if something like that happened to you today, if you say everybody in work is plotting to get rid of me, fire me, what will you do, you know? Some people, what they'll do is, they'll say, okay, they're plotting, let me go and gather my own group, and I'll start plotting, you know? <laughs> That's how we think, you know? We think we'll match their efforts, right? Or some good Christians, what will they do? They'll immediately run to the pastor and say, pastor, they're plotting like this. Please pray for me. I'll, the pastor will say, you also, I'll pray. You also pray. See? What does the psalmist do? Very interesting. He's saying, even though they are sitting and plotting against me, verse 23, your servant will, notice, he does not say pray. Your servant will meditate. See, even though they are sitting there plotting his downfall, there's a big problem there. He's saying, I'm not going to directly go jump into prayer, ask petition. No, no, I will meditate. <laughs> because why? Because the psalmist knows if you meditate, you will see the greatness of God, the goodness of God. When you see that, this princess plotting will seem like nothing to you. You will believe in your great and good God, and that faith will bring you the victory. You see, he knows just because they are plotting, just because there is a problem, you should not immediately go and run just, you know, desperately pray. No, no, you sit down and you meditate. Like I said, I'm not talking about emergencies. I'm talking about the regular checkup, okay? The regular way to do prayer, my friend, is to go through the word, meditation on the word, not just directly jump into prayer. If you want your prayer to improve, your prayer life to improve, that's the way to go. Some people are saying, this is so hard, you know, how can I do this? No, my friend, it's not hard. We are doing it all the time. In fact, we are meditating on something all the time. Think about that. <laughs> your child is sick. You go to work. The thing that's running in your mind the whole day is what? My child is sick. 
I wonder what's happening now. I wonder the temperature came down. I wonder how she's doing. You know, fully that is running in your mind, right? You know what I mean? What we are saying, instead of fully running that in your mind, what needs to fully run? <laughs> My child is sick, but by his stripes, she is healed, you see. Meditate on the word instead of the problem. See, we're all doing it all the time. We're simply saying you need to meditate on the word. If you want to really pray, you need to meditate on the word. Give time for that, you see. And God will help you. If you make a decision, God will help you, my friend. Why are we doing all this? In order to see God. That's the whole point, you see. We want to see God. How powerful he is. How easily he can heal our child. How easily he can deliver us from this debt. How easily, how powerfully, how lovingly he can take us to a greater glory in life. You want to see that, see. Unless you see that, faith will not come. Victory will not come. You need to see God for who he is in all his glory. At least a little bit of glory you should see. Psalm 27 verse 1. I want to do a little example here, okay? I want to meditate before you. Little public meditation, let's do. Okay? Psalm 27, just an example. Okay? What you can do with a few verses, meditating. Verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers... Oh, let me stop. Now, if we're just reading the Bible, we'll quickly read it, you see. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold. Whom shall I fear? Just keep going. No, no, but this is meditation. You've got to stop and you've got to think. The Lord is my light and my salvation. You just stop and you say, the Lord. That L-O-R-D in capital means, it means Jehovah. The personal name of God, he revealed his name to Moses. See, if you know that, you can recollect that. And you think about that, how he revealed his name to Moses in the burning bush. And it was that same Lord, that Jehovah, who freed Israel out of Egypt. And then you come to the next word, the Lord is my light. That same God who delivered people out of Egypt's slavery and walked them through the Red Sea is my light. And you think, why is he saying light? What is so great about light? You know, today we have current and electricity and, you know... Even our phone gives off light. If you're in a dark place, you simply turn on your phone. That gives off some light. But to David, light was a very precious thing. There was no electricity, you see. Many times he had to travel in the dark through the forest and through the woods. And there was no light. He doesn't know who's hiding there, waiting to kill him, you see. And he's thinking, what does he see? He says, the Lord is my it's okay. I don't need current, electricity, nothing. I don't need phone, nothing. I have the greatest source of light, the light giver, God himself, the Lord himself. He is my light. He will shine the light and show me where they are hiding. <laughs> See, this is what meditation is. You imagine why David said that. You get into his world, you open your mouth and you say, the Lord is my light. In the same way that he showed light to David and showed him the situation, he will shine the light on my situation. Show me what I'm doing wrong. Help me to correct it. The Lord is my light. It's only meditation, right? The Lord is my light. And then he continues, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I? Salvation, he says. He's not only my light. He doesn't only show me what's wrong and how to correct it. No, no. He's also my salvation. He saves me. He saves me. From whomever comes against me, he saves me. And then he says, whom shall I fear? Because he is there to save me. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. The translation says, strength of my life. The Lord is the strength. When I have no strength, this Jehovah God is strong. Isaiah 40, chapter 40 says, don't you know, have you not known the creator, the Lord, the ends of the earth? He does not become weary or tired. The strength of the Lord never fades. And he is the strength of my life. See, you start associating other passages with it. You start thinking, you start speaking, confessing. The Lord is my strength. I am strong. Of whom shall I be afraid? Then you go on to the next verse. Now this is a fast meditation. You really want to get into it, it can be even slow, you see. Slower than this. 
But for now, let me just go on faster. Verse 2. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. He's saying when people come against me to eat up, literally kill me, my enemies, they dig a pit for me, but they stumble and fall into that own, in the, into their own pit. Why? The Lord is my light and salvation. Verse 3. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arises against me yet, or in this I will be confident. What is he saying? Even though an army comes against me, and these are not just simple words, you see. David in his lifetime really experienced all these things. Army came against him, war came against him, the whole nation, very nation of Israel itself came against him. His own son led an army against David. He's experienced this first hand army coming, war coming against him. The greatest enemies of the world congregating, plotting to kill him, coming against him. All these experiences, he's experienced it. But what does he say? My heart shall not fear, yet I will be confident. I will not fear, I will be confident. Why? The Lord is my light and my you see, his eyes are on the Lord. He keeps his focus on God. The Lord is my light, therefore I will not fear. And then come to verse 4. Now this is a very important verse. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. Now you may think after reading all this army and war and enemies, he's saying one thing I ask, that I seek after. You may think he's going to say, Lord, one thing I want, please deliver me from this army or from this enemy or from this war, you know. You may think that's what he's going to ask. But instead, what does he ask? Look at the verse. One thing I ask, that I desire, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. One translation says, glory of the Lord. To gaze upon the beauty or the glory of the Lord to inquire in his temple. But some translations will say, instead of inquire, meditate in his temple. Do your translations say that? Meditate. He's saying, the army is coming, the enemy is coming, the war is coming, everything is coming, but one thing I want more than anything else, God. Forget about these things. I want to dwell in your house, meaning experience your presence all the days of my life. I want to gaze upon your beauty. I want to see you, God. Never mind the army and the enemy. I want to see you. Gaze upon your beauty. And I want to meditate in your presence. <laughs> For him, the army is not a big thing. For him, the greater thing. One thing that he seeks more than anything else is not the deliverance from his great problem. No, it is to see God. To see God's glory. To see God's beauty. What does that mean? He wants to see how amazing of a light and salvation God can be to him. How amazingly good God can be to him. How amazingly loving God can be to him. How amazingly powerful God can be to him and manifest in his life, you see. He wants to see the glory of the Lord. Because when you see God in his glory, when you see, see, we all know he's good, he's great, he's glorious. Of course, we all know that the words have become almost meaningless sometimes. Yes, Lord is good, finished, over. No, 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 that's not the point. You need to see how good he is. How great he is. How powerful he is. How far does his goodness extend? How far does his love and power extend? If you can see, if you can get a glimpse of that, my friend, the army and the enemy will seem like nothing to you. Your problems in life will seem like nothing to you. The reason our problems are seeming so big and we're always thinking about that is we are not taking the time to think about our bigger God. Our God is bigger than our problems. He's mightier than our situations. He can deliver you from anything just like that. This is nothing, my friend. Put your eyes on God. See, Be like David and say, Lord, one thing I want. Reveal yourself to me. Show me your glory. Let me see your beauty. Let me help me to meditate. He's saying, one thing I will seek, to meditate in your house, in your temple. What is the result of this meditation? Verse 5, he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. He's saying, after meditating, after requesting like this, he'll saying, he will hide me. 
He will lift me up high. Verse 6. My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. The faith. He's speaking the language of faith. He's saying, my head will be lifted above my enemies. I will win over them, no matter whether it's an army or whoever it is. And I will come to the temple and the tabernacle and offer sacrifices joyfully and with singing. Verse 7, he says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Verse 8, you have said, seek my face. See, you have said, he's saying, Lord, you have said, seek. See, God doesn't have a physical face. But David is saying, Lord, you have said, seek my, everybody says, seek his face. What does he mean by that? That's what we, he means what we are meaning, you see. We need to see his glory, his beauty, his majesty, how good he is, how great he is. We need to get a revelation, a bigger revelation of him. See, Lord is saying, seek my face. David is saying, Lord, you said seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. He has great problems. You think David didn't have problems, my friend? No, no. But he puts that aside to meditate on God, to seek his face. To, he wants to see God's glory more than anything else, you see. Now you may say, what is this, brother? How long should we meditate like this? This is a fast meditation. But the real meditation is an even slower meditation. Now, when I say meditation, meditation, let me clarify one point, you know. It's not like the meditation that the world talks about. In the world nowadays, this business of meditation is very popular. Now, they are saying you need to take time to meditate, forget about everything else. And they teach you these breathing exercises, you know, uh, you know how to breathe and how to... I'm not talking about that. This is Christian meditation. Please don't confuse the two, you know. They say just breathing is very important. And they say the goal of meditation is to empty the mind. I say to you, the goal of Christian meditation is to fill the mind with God's word. No, it's not at all the same thing. They say, you know, don't think too much. Stop thinking. Just stop thinking. Why? Don't think about words and all these things. Because divine realities, uh, these great realities uh, are far bigger than words can contain. Therefore, no point thinking about words and all that, you know. Just uh, free your mind, empty your mind. But the truth is God, the God, the great God has revealed himself contained it through these words. He has chosen to reveal himself through his word, you see. So there is no comparison between that meditation and this meditation. Totally different. This is filling your mind with God's word. This is not just focusing on some object or clapping your hands like this constantly. No, 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 no. This is looking at the word, speaking the word, focusing on the word, imagining the word. Word is the focus in Christian meditation. So let's get that straight, you know.
What a wonder to live life. What a wonder to live life. Really live life. Overcome anything. What a reason to live. To freely live to every day. Repeat after us, right? repeat after me. Every day, every day with you, Lord. Every day, every day with you, Lord. Every day, sweeter than the day before. Every day, sweeter than the day before. Every day, every day with you, Lord. Yeah.